children and welcome to a special festive edition of Ask Your Lesbian Parent. So we know that the holidays, the festive time of year, can be a very difficult time for, uh, for the kids in our lovely rainbow family and this kid. Walter finds it difficult. <laughs> He's like sitting down there going, whoa, whoa. He just had his, his annual, he has it actually like every other month, but his annual Christmas groom. Looking very handsome. And then I put a bow on him and made it into a TikTok. So he's having a hard day. He's like, too many people have touched me today. It's not okay. He doesn't really enjoy uh, touching. He's like me. He likes he likes a massage, like a good old back scratch, a bum scratch. A scratch behind the ears. Like, ooh, like a massage. But if you get too like teeny weeny, like, I'm just gonna touch that thing near your eye, or like, I'm gonna get this bit of thing. Like, what are you gonna do? Touch me. Yeah, I don't like having my makeup done. I don't like getting my hair done. I don't. Nails. Like, well, I don't have any nails, but I don't like doing nails. Trying to fix your Try and, like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> You are already like. No. I'm gonna, like, what are you doing? So, we know that this time of year can be very difficult for the young uns in our rainbow family and some older ones too because I have, Christmas is all about family and let's be honest, it's not about the family you choose generally. It's about the people who you are biologically related to and they may have some difficult opinions such as homophobia or transphobia. So instead, <laughs> we bring to you your ultra accepting, loving, lesbian moms. So, the most asked question probably in the question sticker on our story was what did you think of happiest season if you don't know it was like the first lesbian christmas rom-com is it is that what they're claiming yes i mean i i would argue that imagine me and you had christmas elements mm, i wouldn't put it down as a no. christmas movie <laughs> That's fair, that's fair. Um, Definitely some other films where they feature some lesbians at Christmas time though. Really? I don't know, I'm trying to think. And also featured, not like the main part. Yeah, to be fair, this is the main, it's, yeah, an, it's, the, an, main, it's the main thing. It's, it's the, the main, main thing. story. It has Kristen Stewart in, who I didn't realise before this film, is a miniature human being. She is so small, she's really yeah. cool. Petite in every way. And they cast her with a girlfriend who is a good, like, good head taller. Yeah, she's a, like, so tall lady. every time they kiss. Well, then there's a scene where they're sat in a car, and <laughs> I'm like, whoa, that looks weird, like. It's a bit like someone took the Photoshop photo and just went, so Jessica's actually quite a bit taller than me, and so I'm sitting on a higher chair right now, and uh, I'm sitting on but then Jessica's sitting on a low chair, but then it was too low, and then it looked weird, because obviously normally I'm a bit lower, so now she's sitting on a cushion. Like, so now we're the same height. I know, what the hell are we doing talking about it? We're not even the same height. <laughs> anyway, so what do we think of the film? I was a bit disappointed. We were warned by friends going into this that you will be sad before you get happy. But I didn't feel like I got happy in the end. Mm. You know what I mean? So, oh yeah, spoilers. <laughs> spoilers, clearly. It's kind of a coming out story wrapped inside a lesbian Christmas narrative. So I was watching it for like the fun lesbian Christmas. Woo, go home and meet the family. This could be some wacky hijinks. Mm -hmm. But what we actually got was like lesbian go home for Christmas and meet the family. Oh, but she hasn't actually come out yet. So really this is all about her coming out journey and also some of the stuff that she does that doesn't make her seem like a wonderful human uh, in aid of not coming out. Mm. So actually the whole moral of the film almost was how do people deal with their sexuality in terms of coming out and how do other people respond to that? Yes. My, the reason I wasn't super happy with the film, I think, is that I understand this is a narrative that works for a lot of people and that a lot of people would associate with the whole idea that I'm not out to my family, but I have this partner that I live with. And I get that and I think that's really interesting. And yes, would have been good to explore. I just feel like the, the central character who hadn't come out to her family just didn't do great humaning. Yeah, like aside, put that point aside, she just like a lot of her other actions. Which... <laughs> I, mean, I didn't think she was a great human overall. And then it kind of made it seem like, oh, it's okay. I think what the thing is like, I think they were just trying to make a point of how she hadn't quite, she hadn't come of age. It was a coming of age story as well, but how like she hadn't quite learned to prioritize herself over her family's needs and wishes. So she was still trying to like impress her father, put him ahead of her, her girlfriend. But then there's like this weird relationship that she has with her sisters, where I'm also like, you're not great. And I kind of, I, the whole way through this film basically, I was thinking that the Kirsten Stewart character just needed 
to get with the other character's ex, who was stellar, 10 out of 10, would recommend a good, a good one. We don't know that much about her. Other okay, we don't know that much about her. <laughs> but she seemed excellent. And also- Other than the fact that, well, and actually- She's played by Aubrey Plaza, who I don't know, maybe she just well, made also, the world really like, great. I guess but. you liked her because, well, they portrayed it that she was kind of proud of her sexuality, but- Or just not hiding it, but also she had been- She was outed. She had been outed by this by girlfriend, girlfriend character who hadn't come out yet to her family. And anyway. she's a bit like, ah. Anyway, I just, I just- well, I, so you're, you're, Yeah, no one needs to know a detail just wrapping this scene all for up. scene. They've seen the film, like Jesse. like they just need to know your opinion of it. Wrapping this all up, what I would like to say is I understood why this is a narrative in the lesbian films that should exist. I didn't feel like it was the first lesbian Christmas film that should have been made, you know, if we're choosing from storylines for lesbian Christmas films. And I just felt like that character could have been better. She could have been a better girlfriend for Kirsten Stewart. She just didn't earn it. She did not earn Kirsten Stewart by the end of that film. Hmm. Kirsten deserved better. I did like it when Kirsten was just like, it's too late, I'm sorry. Gives her her like speech about how she'll like always put her first and how she's out now blah blah you'd expect her to be like okay and they romantically kiss because yeah. that's kind of classically what's happened I, you know, in a I, romance but she actually says no sorry it's too late and and she said to her best friend actually i need someone who's already out and kind of has done that process with themselves already and isn't like weirdly immature and has this fight with their sister in front of other adults like a physical knockdown fight. But I think the point of the film is that like, equally adult sister. That bit stuck with me. Oh gosh, right. That's not what this film, this video is about. Yeah. I mean, I personally thought it was kind of like an okay film. I think it's good that it had lesbian representation in the mainstream and it's sad it wasn't put on cinemas because cinemas are shut, but you know, I would have gone and seen it in the cinema and I would have come out and thought like, yeah, kind of don't mind that I spent like an extortionate amount of money to go see that. Yeah. I mean, I, we actually did pay to see it. We, I, we, we did pay. We rented, we rented <laughs> from it. From Amazon Prime. Yeah, because it's not out yet in, in, the, in England, so we rented it from Amazon. I, uh, I would also have been pleased it to have given this. had a happy ending. This. No one died. I'm happy to have given this my money. It was written and directed by an actual lesbian. F- it had a happy ending. I'm just saying. Jessica doesn't deserved un- better. Jessica just doesn't understand because she never had to go through the coming out thing herself. How do you deal with grandparents asking you where the boyfriend is when they know you're a lesbian? You just tell them, like, <laughs> you just say, ha ha, that's a funny one, grandma. You know, I don't have a boyfriend. Because I'm gay. And that's it. Even if they weren't joking, you just say it like that. Oh, I quite like that. In, in not a, like, aggressive way, just a slightly, like, you know. Grandma, you're such a joker. Do you mean my girlfriend? Oh yeah, she's absolutely fine. We did this, we're so romantic. Just, like, move on away from it about how amazing your girlfriend is. Oh yeah, or just every time they say the word boyfriend, substitute it in your mind for girlfriend. Like, oh, I know, why don't I have a girlfriend yet? I've really been looking. But you know, this year, 2020, it's been really hard to find girls. Yeah. This one is a bit of a saucy one, but it has been asked with some green and red Christmas hearts, so it's therefore Christmas themed. I have HEDS and my jaw dislocates so easily. I know one of these days it's gonna dislocate while doing things. I know communication isn't is always good, but I'm not sure if I should give my partner a disclaimer beforehand, which could be really embarrassing, or just hope it doesn't happen and deal with it if it does, especially if this is in a post-COVID more casual situation rather than an actual relationship. What would um, you do if we had like never had sex before and this is like we'd just been oh dating gosh. and like we've been dating throughout the whole COVID situation like online? Oh my goodness. Would you say, just so you know, my jaw might dislocate whilst we're getting dirty down there. I feel like from that, I'm getting what your response would be. In the actual fact of when we first started, I don't think I did say to you, FYI, I fall apart sometimes. No. Did I? No. Not, and not just before we like slept together. You might have already told me that on a date. I think it's better to mention when you're not in a, not about to like, you know, mm-hmm. engage mm-hmm. in any physical intimacy. When you meet maybe just having dinner or you're out for a walk or just, you know, with that person. To then say to them like, oh, just like, you know, I actually really, I dislocate really easily. Um, usually to like, you know, when to pressure. Because Jessica told me, you told me that. You told me you got palsies when oh, yeah, when you yeah. had pressure applied to it. So like you just gave me an example of yourself. Like, oh, when I lay on my own leg for ages. So that kind yeah. of registered with me like, oh, I can't like squish her. 
petty loving squished. But I think if it's in a kind of dating situation and it's at the very start, it's good to just drop in something about how you have that condition, but maybe link it to something else. So like, oh yeah, I have that uh, pair of crutches there because I have EDS and sometimes I need them. And then later on, should something happen, you can go, oh, this is just my EDS, like, don't worry about it. Easier to do that than to break a mood by listing the potential things that could potentially go wrong because none of those things could go wrong I mean I have a bad habit of doing that like sometimes like Jessica's like hi like all kind of and I'm like just so you know I ate loads of beans today so you know my, don't press too hard on my tummy she's like <laughs> okay <laughs> sharing with the group. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. I am scared of the dentist and haven't been in eight years. Any advice on overcoming this fear? Go. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, is, that is the like, um, that's how they treat people with phobias, don't they? They're like, you scare spiders, here's a spider. Touch the spider, feel the spider. <laughs> <laughs> yup. <laughs> <laughs> it might be a good thing. We've lost her to the beams. <laughs> she got hysterical because she started laughing at her own joke before she told it. <laughs> so, <laughs> back to the dentist one. Mm. No, it is literally just you have to just go. Because like, you're not going to get over something until you go and like you'll just catastrophize it in your head and think about all the potential things that could go wrong. So what you need to do is find a dentist that you personally have recommended by a friend or family mm. member. So you already know that there's some trust there. You could basically go on the website, see if there's a photo of that dentist so you can like picture them in your mind. Is it wise to ring up reception and tell them that you have a phobia? Oh yeah, yeah, I get it. Because like... they, can, they know which dentist in the practice is best with that. Yeah, if you don't know which dentist you want to see, but you just know that that practice is particularly good, then yeah, you can just ring up and say, I haven't been for eight years, I'm really scared. Um, could you recommend someone? And then also what they normally do is just for you, if you ask them to as well, is just say, could you put it in my notes? I'm extremely nervous. Because then my, on my practice, it will come up when you, reg when you check in that this is an extremely nervous patient. So then I already know that's how you're feeling before you've even stepped into my surgery. Not that I treat anyone differently, but it just, you don't have to then explain why you're maybe being a bit odd, you know, for your normal self. <laughs> yeah, and it's something you deal with a lot yeah, as so, a dentist. Yeah, so as dentists we like deal with it like every day. Literally we'll see like a phobic patient every day, so it's not, do not feel embarrassed about it because it's nothing we haven't seen. It's nothing new. All right, next question. We have a son and we raise him to be whoever he wants. He's 19 months old now and he can wear any color that he likes. Next year, he'll go to kindergarten, and we totally go by put on whatever you like, and if he wants to wear a dress, he can. But we're afraid of other kids making fun of him, knowing how hard it could be for such a small child. How do you think we should handle the situation? All right, well, my advice would be to first of all, go and talk to the adults in the situation, to the uh, teachers, to the faculty members. Just let them know that, you know, your child just likes to wear whatever they like to wear. And if there are some children picking on them, to be really aware of that and to, you know, get onto that as soon as it starts happening and to stop it in its tracks. However, one thing I would say from spending a lot of time with our small nephew is that kids don't really notice. I was gonna say like that age, I don't think they would, I don't think they would pick up on it. Our nephew knows he's a boy, but does he really know what a boy is? Like it's only because he's been referenced to as a boy, but I don't think, he doesn't know what the gendered norms are for defining a boy. Like exactly. when he looks at books, he's like, that's a daddy giraffe and that's the mummy giraffe. But he's literally just going on the height difference. <laughs> I'd be like, I would let my child wear whatever they wanted, but I would be worried about the consequences of what other parents or teachers more of them than children at a young age because I feel like they should know better. Do you feel though, as we've become a more progressive society, that things children were bullied for back in our day when we were young are things that are not likely to be bullied for now? Like there's more of an awareness of variance within gender. Whereas when we were in primary school, there would be like a boy that gets bullied for being effeminate, mm. but a teacher nowadays would be more likely to pick up on it rather than say, oh, you just need to be stronger. Yeah, I mean, we'd hope so. We'd hope so, there we go. <laughs> That's our advice on that one. We hope the world's improved.
Does Claudia regret not coming out earlier? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think like, I don't think you should have regrets on, like I personally came out when I knew for sure myself. So I came out exactly the right time for me. I didn't, I wasn't like in the closet before. I wasn't trying to be someone else or hide in my opinion. Like, you know, like I was always my authentic self at the time. And then I, as I sort of realized then, then I just was like, oh, and then I kind of tried to explore that with books and watching things um, to kind of know for sure. And also like, what I, one of the things I'm quite proud of is I didn't come out and I didn't like, not that anyone should not that it's a bad thing, but I'm quite proud of it personally, that I just decided myself and didn't need like to validate my decision with experimental relationships. Yeah. Like I just really just, I just searched my soul and, and I just wanted to make sure I was sure. Before. It was about you, it wasn't about someone else. Yeah, exactly. All right, and final question. Tips for dealing with Christmas or other holidays when you're disabled and don't have much energy? Really good question. Yes, often when it comes to the holidays, we feel personally an expectation, but also there's a social expectation that there are a number of things we need to uh, do and agree with and make from scratch. And fortunately, this year, COVID does mean that the kind of rigmarole of going to visit every single relative you have won't be happening. So you can just be at home in your bubble, which is, I mean, as Good a disabled person, depends. a little bit of a plus. Does it? I mean, it depends if you like your bubble. Oh, yes. I'm just trying to really be positive. Yeah, okay, yeah, sorry. End of the video. <laughs> Things that will be really important are being aware of your limits and what they are, knowing that even though there might be 10 things that you really want to do to celebrate Christmas this year, that that might be a little bit much. Know how many you can actually do. Check your list with someone else who can tell you whether your list is accurate and maybe you should dump another two things from it. And then- Or like another half of what you've written. And then <laughs> have real fun doing the smaller amount of things that you can do because you'll actually have energy for them. You'll have maybe slept a bit better because you're not so stressed about getting all the many, many things done. If you're not the one running Christmas, but rather someone who's being roped in to help out with Christmas, it's good to let people know your limits, even if they're parents who don't necessarily listen when you tell them, yo, I'm disabled and I can't do everything. Just be very upfront with them ahead of time. You've given me these five tasks. I only have the energy for these three. So if you make me do all five, I'm really worried that I'm not going to be good enough. You could like, you know, like how you get Christmas stockings. Yeah. And if you have like a parent or someone or a partner or whatever, who's expecting more from you than you think you can give and it's upsetting you and stressing you out, write them a Christmas card mm -hmm. and like, Put it, give it, that's the first thing you give them in the morning. So like leave it almost like as if it's a stock, you could put it in a stocking or mm -hmm. like, you know, do you know what I mean? Like slip it under their bedroom door. Sure. And it just has a very honest, like, happy Christmas. I really want this day to be special. And then just say how you feel about the day, but don't give you all your like, don't go into all your anxieties, but just say sure. like, I really want to help out today and make sure you have a good time, but um, please don't expect too much from me. I know I really want to help you out today, but also I'm having quite a bit of pain, so I'd really appreciate if I could do sit-down jobs. Yeah, but I think sometimes it's probably best to just write it in a letter, oh, I agree. like or a card, because it's been premeditated. Like you give it to them when they're like in a quiet mood. Hopefully they're not too stressed because they've just woken up. And sometimes if you wait till I would imagine like if you wait till later when it's all like the chaos of Christmas, mm -hmm. their response might just be quite snappy, like oh just do it. Or like, yeah. oh, it's just because you want to go watch that Christmas program or whatever. Please, everyone, take Claudia's suggestion this year. <laughs> Slip a note under your parents' door and tell us how it goes. <laughs> yeah. I'm intrigued. I'm kind of intrigued to what kind of notes are going to be written We're going to look at these uh, comments down here. <laughs> and the day after Boxing Day and <laughs> be, be like, like, they'd be like, huh. I know you like spending Christmas as a family, but I do not. I'm not leaving my room until Boxing Day. Happy Christmas. I'd be like, that's not really what I meant, but fine. You know. Go for it, hon, if that makes you happy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, better than them banging on your door like, are you coming out? When are you coming like, out? I did tell you guys, I, I left a note. I told you very politely that no, not till Boxing Day. Thank you so much for joining us for our festive special of Ask Your Lesbian Parents. 
<laughs> you can find other episodes in the series by clicking the card that is up here in the corner. Hope you've all had a lovely weekend and we shall see you throughout the week every other day for this 2020 Vlogmas. Bye! Bye.